All right. Thank you for joining us to learn more about Long Beach and your habitat, particularly with your the parkways of Long Beach. Our speakers today will be Tina Fan from Long Beach Water and Chris Sarabia, board president from California Native Plant Society. Tina, if you'd like. Thank you, Anne-Marie, for the introduction. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'd like to thank you all for joining our third webinar dedicated to the Native Plant Parkway Program. And before we get into the specifics of the workshop, I'll just provide some background info on our department and quickly go over the details of our program. So in a nutshell, the Long Beach Water Department is a municipally owned water and sewer utility that provides service to almost 500,000 customers in a 50 square mile service area. And if you laid all of our pipeline out from end to end, it would stretch all the way from here to Long Beach to Houston, Texas. And we provide customer service response 24 seven, 365 days a year. And we, are, we pride ourselves on being a recognized leader in water conservation and innovation with our various conservation programs. Next slide, please. So early last year, we launched our Native Plant Parkway program. And for those of you unfamiliar with the term parkway, it's the grass median area between the sidewalk and the curbside found in many neighborhoods here in Long Beach. And the parkway program is a voucher-based program, and we offer pre-designed kits of California native plants, mulch, and pavers. So these kits are fully funded by the Long Beach Water Department. So they come at no cost to the customer. and you, the participants bear only the cost of removing their turf and installing the plants. And this can be a DIY project that you handle by yourself or with your friends and family, or you can have a gardener to help you out. Next slide, please. To be eligible for this program, your parkway must have living turf grass at the time that you apply. And in instances where the grass is dead or already removed, we might be able to approve your application if you can provide photos, recent photos of the project area that has living grass. And as a side note, you cannot combine our parkway program voucher with any other incentives that we offer such as lawn to garden for the same project area. However, if you would like to do the parkway program for just your parkway and lawn to garden for your front or backyard, that is totally acceptable. Next slide, please. Okay, and here's an outline of the process for those of you who are interested in participating. The first step is to apply online at lbwater.org slash parkway. And our team will come out to inspect your project site and measure your square footage of your parkway. Then we will email or mail you our parkway program guidebook, which is also found on our website. After looking through the guidebook, you can choose which plan of plants you want to receive. And when your project is approved, you can remove your turf grass. Once that's done, let us know and we can schedule your mulch and stone to be delivered to your address. And we will contact the nursery to start preparing your plants. Then when your plants are ready for pickup, we'll let you know. Oh. When the plants are ready for pickup, we'll let you know and you can go pick them up and install them in your parkway. And when your project is complete, we ask that you please notify us so we can conduct a post inspection and take a few photos. And our last step you can see is display your native free plants, your free native plants here live here signs in your parkway. But at this time, we don't have these signs because we're working on updating our logo for the design. But once we have these signs produced, we will be distributing them to any participants who want to display this sign. And that concludes my part of the presentation. And now we get to hear Chris share his expertise on California native plants. Awesome, thank you, Tina. And thanks, Anne-Marie, for the, the great intro. Um, so today we will be um, learning about a thriving native garden and basically what uh, tips for success um, you can use uh, for your native plant parkway um, project. So <clears throat> the best way to ensure a thriving native plant garden is through an accurate understanding of native plants and your garden site. So along with careful planning, uh, how you begin a native garden really influences its success. 
And so California Native Garden is an ongoing learning process, even for people who have been tending a native garden for years. So some basic principles can really help you get off to a good start. And so we really want to emphasize that um, you, you want to enjoy this process of learning and discovery. Um, my name is Chris Sarabia, and I'm with the California Native Plant Society. Uh, I'm the board president, and I also represent our local South Coast chapter, which covers Long Beach. The California Native Plant Society is a nonprofit, and we're dedicated to conserving California native plants and their natural habitats, while increasing the understanding, the enjoyment, and the horticultural use of native plants. And so I just want to, you know, with this idea of enjoying the process of learning and discovery, um, I've been working with native plants for 15 years or so, and I'm still learning. Every day I learn, I still have plants die on me. And so it's, you know, it's really, um, it's really more of a fun thing to do. And really, if, if you uh, follow these tips for success, you probably won't have <laughs> any of these issues happen to you where a plant may die because uh, you know we've done the, the hard part of learning this process for you. So uh, please pay attention and take some notes. Um, we'll have some time at the very end of the presentation for some questions. Um, if you wanna write them down and save them for the end, you can also type them in in the chat uh, function and um, we'll we'll kind of keep tabs on those questions. So let's get started. We do have a pretty jam-packed presentation. So the first part, uh, we will be understanding native plants. And so with that is what is a native plant, natives and biodiversity, and the benefits of native plants. So a native plant grows here naturally. Um, these are basically plants that um, we're here before European exploration of the west coast of North America. California native plants have evolved here over a very long period, and they've co-evolved with the animals, the fungi, and all the little microbes uh, that form this complex network in soil and in the ecosystem relationships. So they are definitely the foundation of our native ecosystems and the basis upon which all life depends. So what is the difference between native plants and other low water use plants? Well, um, non-native drought friendly plants, and you see a lot of these around in a lot of uh, uh, low water use uh, projects uh, throughout, throughout California really. And so these plants are from the Mediterranean. Um, the Mediterranean climates are different than California climates. They're very similar. Um, but they still need, these plants still need supplemental irrigation because of the different climates in other parts of the world that the plants are coming from. And so, um, you know, they, they still need water. Whereas native plants, I always tell people, if you go to the poppy reserve or if you're driving on the Angeles Crest Forest or through Malibu, really anywhere that has some natural setting, you don't see irrigation because these plants are growing naturally. They, they thrive on the natural rainfall. Whereas these other plants here, you don't see these in a, a, a natural setting because they need supplemental water. So that's the difference. Um, and so when you look for plants at a nursery, you wanna make sure they say California native plants versus just low water use plants or drought tolerant plants because those could be from another part of the world. Our next section, we will talk about uh, natives and biodiversity. And so we'll talk a little bit about the biodiversity hotspot that is California and understanding the bigger picture. So California is really special. Um, it's incredibly special. We live in a part of the world that is just, it's just so unique, right? A lot of people come to California for various reasons but we have more native plant species than of any other state in the nation. So our landscapes can either help or harm this precious diversity that we enjoy when we go out for a hike or when we go out to uh, one of these nice parks or the beach. Um, so I also wanna point out that California also has more rare plants than most states. Next slide, please. But even more important uh, is the fact that native plants form the basis of ecosystems. So wild spaces or open spaces uh, alone, those are not enough to support the biosphere. Today, the vast majority of land in the lower 48 states is privately owned. 
And so here in California, it's about 50% of land that's privately owned. And so as development continues on some of these lands, uh, we need our built landscapes to help. Uh, every little patch of land helps. And so when it comes to our gardens, there's no substitute for native plants and supporting life. Next slide, please. And so take insects, for example. Recently, we had noted ecologist Doug Tallamy. Look him up. He's a very interesting guy. Awesome YouTubes out there. Um, but he's also the author of Bringing Nature Home. And so he, he, this is a great book about doing exactly what we're talking about today. And so he shared his findings from more than two decades of, decades of research. And basically, his conclusion was that native plants are far superior in supporting the insects that feed the birds and other creatures as we move up the food chain. And so Doug wants people to like us to know that without insects, none of us survive. So we better start paying attention to what we're looking or what we're doing to our food webs, because, um, you know, we're, we're definitely should be in the business of building living landscapes. And if you could just go back, Anne-Marie, real quick. We have uh, uh, a picture of a butterfly here. Um, maybe some people know what it is. Maybe some people don't. It's a monarch, monarch butterfly. And on the left, some might say that's not a monarch, but it is. It's the caterpillar of the monarch, right? And so it turns into a monarch over its life period. And so some of these species like these have co-evolved with native plants. People love monarchs. And so, you know, these are some of the little critters that rely on us to uh, convert our landscapes to help them out. Next slide, please. And so typically this is what we see when we look at our yards, right? This is our typical home with the lawn and some random trees, um, some ornamental shrubs. And, you know, you, you see this as you drive through neighborhoods and nothing, no big deal, right? But if you were to see it through the eyes of a bird or through a different lens. Um, next slide, please. This is one way to think about it. You know, these are basically bird feeders, right? Every single shrub, every single plant, every single tree, they're foraging hubs. And so, you know, we may say, oh, that's just this shrub or that shrub, not paying too much attention as to what species it is, but we're definitely not fooling the birds, um, you know, and we end up failing them because these foraging hubs may be less quality for the birds. And so native plants are actually the larval food for pollinators. Larval is just a fancy word for caterpillars. So the, the caterpillars um, will eat the, the, uh, the native plants. And so they provide basically the right food at the right time. Pollinators can nectar on non-native plants such as lavender, but they're not going to raise their young there. They need California natives. Next slide, please. So how many species of native plants do we need? Well, and how many species of pollinators do we need, right? And how many species of birds do we need? Well, we need all of them. This is because biodiversity equals ecosystem services. And so we've already degraded 60% of the earth ecosystem services. And, you know, to put that into context, 87% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants, they're pollinated by animals. That's a big percentage. And so if we're losing our pollinators, then you know we're gonna lose something next, right? And so losing our pollinators is not an option. Next slide, please. So what we plant does matter. Our choices here in this digital room um, can literally change the world for the better. And it's not that hard. You can play an incredibly vital role in the health of our watersheds and ecosystems. Next slide. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the benefits of native plants. Um, native plants save water, they reduce maintenance, they reduce harmful runoff and support the local ecology and the local wildlife. Next slide. And so once established, native plants need very minimal irrigation beyond the normal rainfall, conserving water and saving you money. So replacing water consuming high maintenance traditional landscapes and lawn with California native plants can reduce the average homeowner's water consumption by 
there were studies done on this and this is the number they found, which is quite a big number. Even more savings when you include rain gardens, swales and other drainage control techniques. Uh, once established, native plants can withstand little or no watering and can rely on an average annual rainfall alone. Next slide. Next. Uh, and so water efficiency, efficiency is the Long Beach, <laughs> Long Beach way of life. Uh, Long Beach water really has been a trendsetter in all of the rebate programs that they've offered. And that's because Long Beach is a unique place. And so with this Parkway program, this is another one of the great programs to not only create habitat, but to save water. It's definitely a win-win. And so, you know, with this program, we are watering efficiently in our landscape year round. We're learning the benefits of converting lawn to native plants. And we're learning how to replace lawns with beautiful water efficient native plants. Next slide. And so this next part, we'll be talking about planting for habitat, which is when to plant and when to plan, or vice versa, when to plan and when to plant, and how to select plants and their different habitat values. Next slide. And here we have a pause for Tina to come in and tell us about something exciting. Yes, so we have our first poll question. And if you answer, you have the chance of winning a free soil moisture sensor, which I have one right here. And a soil moisture sensor can help you gauge when to water your plants because it can measure how wet your soil is at the root depth of your plants below the surface. So please type your answer in the chat box. How would you classify the animal in this photo? If you see this little bug in your garden, which you might recognize from an earlier slide, would you leave them be or try to remove them? All right, please answer in the chat. And at the end, we will have chosen two names. Um, hopefully you stick around. If for any reason you don't, uh, we have you through registration. Yes, we'll be contacting you by email, the email that you use to register. Great. Thanks, you. Thanks, Tina. Um, Lots that... of answers rolling in. Most yeah. people said A. And A, I think, would be correct. So that this is, is a monarch correct. caterpillar, and they feed on milkweed plants. And these caterpillars turn into monarch butterflies that are wonderful pollinators that are essential to our ecosystem. So congrats to everyone who answered A. Thanks, Tina. Thank you, Tina. All right. So moving on, when to plan and when to plant. And so you can avoid one of the most common pitfalls of beginner native gardeners simply by planting at a different time of the year than you might expect. So California has a different planting season. So let's talk about that. Next slide. And so California um, is a Mediterranean climate. And I like to point that out because a lot of people say, well, we're in a desert and we're not in a desert. Some of California is a desert, but we are a Mediterranean climate, just like these other parts of the world here. And so, you know, something similar to the other parts of the world here is that we have a summer dry climate. Our annual rain is very variable, highly variable. And from year to year, it can vary by many inches. Snow is rare, except at high elevations. And the wildlife uh, developed with these cycles in mind. And so something to just consider and think about as you walk through your garden later tomorrow, this weekend, tonight, um, or even through your neighborhood is, you know, eucalyptus. Where does eucalyptus come from? It's come from Australia, some of it, right? And so we see it out here and it does really well. Um, where does ice plant come from? Ice plants from South Africa. It does really well, right? You see it on the sides of the freeways or on slopes. And so, you know, these plants do well here, but they do need some water. Someone planted them um, and they thrive in Mediterranean climates, but they need a little more water because out of these five areas here, we get the least amount of rain. And just something to point out is, you know, we have California poppies, 
Well, those grow in Chile and they're kind of a problem. They're kind of a weed and vice versa, right? Ice plant and eucalyptus can be a problem in our landscapes. So just something to think about as you walk around and start to think about the different climate we're in and it's how unique it is and what can grow here and what grows here naturally. Next slide. So when should we start planning? Um, now, let's start planning. And that's why we're having this talk right now, right? We're gonna start to plan our project this in the spring. Um, and so some of you are in different phases of the Parkway program uh, uh, project. So right now, what you wanna do, if you haven't already, is get design and planting ideas uh, from a CNPS garden tour. And so the Native Plant Society has a bunch of garden tours going on and you know because of the pandemic they're all virtual at the moment so you can go to our website check out some garden tours check out the plants and what they're going to look like uh, that are going to come in your kit and start to get an idea of of what uh, what your landscape will look like when it's fully mature and so we have these virtual tours that are put on by, by garden ambassadors um, these are people that have just volunteered to show off their gardens, these amazing gardens. Hopefully, uh, some of you out there will volunteer to be a garden ambassador once your native parkway is fully grown and maybe you plant the rest of your uh, lawn and convert it to a native plant garden. So we're going to start to plan now, and that's the key here. Next slide. But when? When should we start? Uh, to plant, right? We're planning now, but when should we start to plant? And so we, you know, we, we emphasize planning now so that you have time to, to get ready to plant. And so any, any, uh, anybody know? Next slide. And so California's planting season is in the fall. Why is that? Uh, this is when the temperatures are cooling and rain is on the way. And so that is typically, that is really when all native plants should be planted, just because uh, if you plant in the spring, you're gonna hit summer. Next slide. And so as we start to plan right now, um, you also wanna start prepping. And that way you have uh, all the spring and all the summer to prepare your landscape. So this could be either sheet mulching, or any other site prep um, that you need to do for your parkway. So a lot of that is removing the grass, um, getting rid of some of the weeds in there, and other um, steps that you can see in the Long Beach Water website. Uh, these are steps to take to make your project more successful. Next slide. And so I want to take a second to just point out some plant communities that are natural in Long Beach. Um, so some of those plant communities are coastal sage scrub. And, you know, you don't have to be an ecologist to understand what I'm talking about. You can visit some of these places that have examples of what coastal sage scrub is. And so if you, if you were to go to a coastal sage scrub uh, habitat, you would smell sage. Uh, and so some of these areas in Long Beach um, are Colorado Lagoon, if you go on the walking path out there. Um, what else? There's Willow Springs Wetlands, which is in Signal Hill. Uh, the Green Belt, which runs through uh, Long Beach. Uh, it kind of runs off of 7th Street and up to 10th, and it's, it's quite a, a long green belt. You also have another green belt along the Alley River. Um, you have DeForest Park. You have Dominguez Gap. So an El Dorado Park actually is another one. And so these are um, great places for you to take a, a walk and kind of get an idea of what coastal sage scrub is and what used to be here in Long Beach. Um, we also have coastal bluffs. And so a great example of coastal bluffs are if, uh, if you go to the beach, if you go along Ocean Boulevard or to Bluff Park, um, all the plants that are on that bluff there are uh, coastal bluff plants. Um, some of them were there and some of them were restored and planted. And so that's uh, a wonderful habitat that we have. And we're you know, very lucky to have that uh, project going on in the coastal bluff area off ocean. Wetlands, we have uh, Colorado Lagoon as part of a wetland. We have the Los Cerritos wetlands. We have Bolsa Chica next door. And so the, those are great examples of wetlands um, that you can visit. 
Um, riparian. Riparian basically means river, along the river. And so we have the Los Angeles River and the San Gabriel River straddling Long Beach. And some of those areas of those rivers are really still natural um, that you can visit and kind of get an idea of what wildlife still thrives in Long Beach and what native plants are still hanging on. And lastly, grassland. Grassland's a tough one. Um, we don't really have many grasslands left uh, throughout the state. But you can get an idea at any of one of these sites what a, a native grass looks like. And there's a lot of native grasses around and a lot of them are beautiful and really, really nice grasses that um, can really emphasize your landscape. Next slide. And so with that in mind, uh, we wanna also think like a watershed. So when it rains, we want to slow, we want to slowly spread and also sink the water into the landscape. And so we have some of these swales and we have mulch that helps us do that. And so there's a variety of ways to really take advantage of, of, uh, of water and free water. Next slide. Free water like rainwater, right? And so a lot of us may have uh, rainwater barrels. There's a lot of programs out there that have given rainwater barrels to us. Um, and, you know, the idea with rainwater capturing is that we can conserve water, we can reduce urban runoff and increase rainwater infiltration and landscape rehydration. And so not just rainwater barrels, but we can do little infiltration basins um, that help to really send that water down into the roots of our plants and really help in rehydrating the the landscape that you know a lot of it is covered with concrete and the water doesn't really get a chance to go down into the soil and the soil needs water so by doing this we end up reducing the energy use and the need for potable water irrigation um, you know a lot of energy goes into creating clean water for us to uh you know drink out of the faucet or water um, out of the uh, water hose. And so anything we can do to be uh, conserving water is, is it's a Long Beach way of life, right? So we want to be conservationists. Next slide. And so this is a, a recent planting here, an example of a recent planting. And you could kind of see the plants there, right? They're small, these are freshly planted. You could even see the footsteps of someone who had just planted in there. And, and so just wanna prepare you that it'll definitely look sparse at first, um, but there are a few tips that you can do to kind of make it look a little nicer. Um, and some of those are by putting rock features out there. You can put a little rock swale there. You have a walking path. You, you might want to put a, uh, a little bench there. And for our parkway, that's really limited, right? But um, the stepping stones are part of the project. And so that'll really make your, your uh, project look good while the plants are getting ready to grow. And um, mulch really helps. Mulch is a very attractive feature. And if we go to the next slide, we can see an example of a planting that was done in 2015. So this is the same one and it, it doesn't look bad, right? But it looks sparse. A lot of people would say, well, hurry up and grow. Um, but, you know, it takes a little bit and we have to be patient. And if you go to the next slide, you can see, you know, within two years, um, this thing explodes with, with wildflowers, with uh, perennial flowers. You've got some sages in there, some poppies, some lupins. And so, you know, it just takes a little patience and um, and some care. And so with all the tips and tricks we will um, give you in the next section, uh, you'll get to this point in no time. So next slide. So part three, we're gonna talk about caring for your parkway. Um, we're gonna get into which plants we've chosen for your parkway design, how to plant, how to water, a couple tips, and we're gonna leave you with some resources and that way you have um, as much, you know, as much or as little as you want to read or watch videos, you have plenty, uh, plenty of homework that you can take home with you to really get an idea of, of what your native plant parkway can look like. And maybe in the future, as you uh, convert your, your lawn, um, you can start to plan now, right? And so the next slide. All right, we have our second poll question for the second winner of our soil moisture sensor giveaway. And we wanna know um, what you think. 
So during the first month after installing your new plants, how often should you water? Please type your answers in the chat. All right, we see some answers trickling in. Looks like a mix between A and B. Chris, would you like to speak on that? Yeah, um, and so we recommend once a week uh, for watering. And this is, so I didn't mention, I work for a, a, um, a restoration group. We plant thousands and thousands of plants uh, every year. And so, we we do water once a week and two to three days is you know half of that and so it really does depend on your soil um on average though once a week is good for the first month and we'll talk about that next uh it really depends on your soil so everyone's soil is different and what's great is that the long beach water department has a section in their um in their program website that talks about your different soils so that you can get an idea of what kind of soil you have and that way you can water appropriately because sand, uh, sandy soils versus clay soils, you're gonna water them very differently. So on average, we're gonna say once a week, but it always depends, right? And so we, we, we can answer questions at the very end, but we will talk a little bit about watering in detail and um, yeah, let's, let's go to the next slide. Here we go. So habitat gardening. And so uh, why do we keep talking about poll pollinators, right? Well, it's because we can't live without them. They're really key to humans, they, for human survival. Um, and so pollination is it's just not a fat, fascinating natural history. It's an essential ecological survival function. So without pollinators, the human race and all of Earth terrestrial ecosystems would not survive. So out of the 1400 crop plants grown around the world, um, and, and those that produce all of our food and plant-based products, almost 80% require pollination by animals. So you can see that 80% is a big number, and that's a lot of pollinators out there, and we need to protect them and we need to take care of them. And so, even, even further um, going down that rabbit hole is that more than half of the world's diet of fats and oils come from animal pollinated plants. And as you know, if you look on ingredients of anything you eat, there's oils in them and we cook with oils, right? And so um, it's, it's very important. And, and one, one more point on that, I don't wanna you know, go too far into the food portion, but more than 150 food crops in the US depend on pollinators. So that's almost all the fruit and grain crops, right? So it's, it's really important for us to protect our pollinators because if they disappear, we're gonna be out there with a Q-tip pollinating all our own plants. And I don't think um, most people wanna do that uh, to get an apple. So it's an essential ecological function and that's why we care about them. And it's not that hard to create the habitat for them. Next slide. So what do we do? What do we do for pollinators? Well, we garden for pollinators. And when planting native plants, it's very easy. Um, and so what we wanna do is have, and, and it's gonna be different for the Parkway program, right? And so we, we tried to um, create the Parkway program and design it to be as close to these recommendations as possible. But we do want to have about 10 different flowering plants that attract pollinators. We want to plant in groups so that there's a mass of the same flower. And we want to have about three different plants in bloom each season. And so it sounds like a lot, but really with the kits we've created, there it's already pretty much done for you. Next slide. And so here's a couple of the plants um, that will be in your kit. And I'll talk a really briefly about them and give you some resources so that you can really um, get into it and, and kind of learn more about your plants. So California sagebrush. California sagebrush is one of the most common plants we have out there. Um, you can see, you know, in areas where there's quail, quail loves it, birds love it, birds made nest in it, birds come and eat the little seeds in it, other plants grow through it. So it's a really good plant to, 
to put in your landscape. And you can see at the bottom of this slide, all the different pollinators that use this plant. Um, you can also see that birds love it, right? There's a little bird symbol there, a caterpillar symbol and a butterfly symbol. And this slide actually comes directly from our Cowscape website. And so I would write that down, Cowscape. Um, it's a great website to check out and learn more about any native plant that's great for landscaping and, and so much more. There's so much information on there. And once you get your plants, you, you want to check this website out and learn more about each plant because they're all so unique and they all have their, their story. Um, this plant smells great. And actually, someone was telling me that they recently saw quail in the South Coast area. Um, and no doubt they were using the, the California sagebrush. So who knows if the quail returns, um, maybe they'll end up in your yard, right? In your parkway. Um, I also want to point out there's a, a name right under California sagebrush. That's just the scientific name. If you wanted to, to take that into note, um, typically we, we use those names when referring to plants just because the regular name may, may have a couple different plants associated with it, but you don't have to take that into consideration. Next slide. And so purple sage, purple sage is one of my favorite plants. Um, you can see the stunning purplish flower. It could be in different shades, but typically this is what it looks like. And um, it attracts a, a whole host of pollinators. You can see them down there. Uh, birds love it. When the flower stalks uh, dry up, the birds will come and they almost act as bird feeders. So you, you wanna leave those on for a little bit for the birds to enjoy a nice lunch. Um, or you can collect them and start you know, to grow your own purple sage for your neighbors. So this is a beautiful plant and it has that uh, gray green leaf there at the bottom corner. And so this will be in some of those kits. The next plant is common yarrow and go to the next slide. This one uh, you've probably seen around. Um, it's, it's a typical landscape plant, has this beautiful white flower. Um, there's different varieties out there. So you may have seen one that's pink or one that's has different hues of, of cream. And so, um, but, but really it's a yarrow in the end that is the plant. And so you may get a different color, but you can see how beautiful it is in the top right. Um, it's actually used in arrangements a lot and pollinators love it. It almost acts like a landing pad for them because it has like a flat flower uh, at the top. And same as a California sagebrush, plants can go through it. It's kind of wispy. It kind of fills in the gaps and it's very low growing. And I think it has a really good smell. Sometimes I, I tell people to smell it. They can't smell it, but um, I could smell this really interesting smell on, on the leaf. And I, I'd recommend um, people take a, a whiff of it if, if you're not allergic to plants, obviously. But um, you could see all the pollinators at the bottom there that really, uh, you know, live off this, this plant and enjoy it. Next slide. So see and note this or blue blossom is one of the common names. This is another uh, one of the species that are in the kits. And the, the one you get will probably be a, a low growing species. It doesn't get too big, but it has this beautiful white flower and also an amazing smell. And if you've ever gone hiking, um, in the San Gabriel's or in San Diego, you probably got a whiff of this when they're in flowering season. And so it's just another striking plant um, with green leaves. So even if it's not flowering, it has a nice uh, color to it. And a lot of species are very dependent on this, including birds and bees. Next slide. And Douglas iris is the next one. And this one, I mean, you could just see how, how beautiful it is. Um, it has this crazy pattern that is not comparable to too many other plants. Um, it's kind of a smaller growing plant and uh, it's, it's in the iris family. And so you may have seen this in flower arrangements or in people's gardens. Um, it may be different versions of this, but really this is the locally native one. And so um, we want to plant this one because we can see that we have some, some different creatures that live off it. And um, I do believe uh, birds also use it, hummingbirds, um, because it has that tube uh, type flower. And so 
This will also be in one of the kits. The next slide. And so lastly is this island alum root. And this is a winner. You've probably also seen this in landscaping. Um, it has this crazy striking uh, pink color. And so when you plant it in a row, I mean, it really, uh, it's almost like a painting, right? It's picture perfect. So this plant attracts hummingbirds. Uh, everyone loves hummingbirds. Um, and so anything we can do to help the hummingbirds, um, as well as our pollinators, uh, you know, it's a win-win. So they're very drought tolerant plants and they're very low growing. When they're done flowering, you can cut the, the flower stalk off and it's, nice, it's a nice green mat um, in your parkway. So those are some of the plants, um, but you can see just a sample is already showing you the beauty of California natives. And you know these are all very uh, drought tolerant, very minimal watering. So why wouldn't you wanna plant some beautiful native plants in your parkway? Next slide. And so, you know, going back to this um, learning process. So because native plants have not been used in landscaping for, for a long time, they've been growing wild in the, for a long time, but not in our, our controlled landscape. Um, we're still learning the ways to take care of them. So in addition, uh, climate is changing as we speak and the maintenance continues to be a learning process. So the information we're sharing is based on what we know today. Um, so we encourage people to go into native gardening with that mindset that it's really a learning process for everyone. And these are the guiding principles to get you started. Uh, but just remember to be open to learning as you go because if you look at any of our uh, 360 virtual garden tours or ambassador videos, you'll usually hear people say, oh, well, I planted this and it died or, because it was a learning process for all of us, right? And it still is. And, and that's great, right? You know, nobody knows everything. And that's why we share this with you. And that's why we have um, all these videos to share with, with uh, the community so that we can all learn together. And maybe you'll teach us something that you learned along the way. So just keep that in mind um, and just be open to it. Next slide. So in this next section, we're going to learn about how to plant. And we're going to it pretty briefly. Um, it's not rocket science. You don't want to overthink it. Um, I wish I could show you in person and maybe in the future we'll have that opportunity. But uh, here's the basic steps. So next slide. So we want to prepare. And we talked about, uh, you know, considering the season. So fall is the best time to plant. And you want to consider the weather. And uh, so what's interesting is in the fall, we typically have uh, Santa Ana winds come. And so you want to keep that in mind and try to plant either way before the Santa Ana's or after. That way they don't toast your plants. And so that's something I always consider uh, in the fall is, uh, you know, I'm about to plant. I say, wait a second, let me, let me see what's forecasted for those Santa Ana's just in case. And so you want to keep that in mind. Um, depending on where you're at with the program, you want to take into uh, consideration the size and space needs of the plants. So your parkway will have a certain size and um, that's part of the design process. Um, so the day before you start to plant, and so this is, you know, in the fall, you have your plants ready, you pick them up, um, everything's ready to go. You, you, you know, you shined your, your shovel, Every, everybody's uh, coming over on Saturday morning to help you out. Um, the day before, you may want to water your parkway. And that's just because your parkway has probably been grass for the last 50 years. And so it's going to be compacted potentially just from that grass just sitting there from people walking on it, maybe a car ran over your parkway. And so um, you want to kind of try to give it a soaking. And, and if you haven't already, right, as part of your uh, prepping process, you want to give it that soaking just so it's easier to dig. And you want to make sure your, your potted plants are, are watered. Um, and this, you know, typically from the nursery, they come a little watered, but uh, you may want to water that pot just so it's, it's ready because these plants are coming from a nursery. Um, they're gonna have a little shock when they're going in the ground. So just keep that in mind. And so when you plant, you're gonna dig a hole as deep as the soil depth of the container. And so 
um, we say as deep as a container and twice as wide as a pot. And um, what you're gonna do is once you dig that hole, you're gonna fill that hole with water, let it drain. If you can do that twice, even better. And what you're doing is just prepping the roots to get into the soil um, in an easier way. Um, you're going to, and I have a plant here, let's see if you could see it, but oh, the video. Well, you're gonna massage the, the pot and just kind of loosen the soil inside the pot. And you're gonna carefully flip it over and remove the plastic pot, shake off any loose soil. If you have roots that are winding on the bottom of the pot, you're gonna carefully unwind them, kind of loosen them. You don't have to be too careful. And, and you know just keep in mind that the winded up roots will be worse than maybe you accidentally rip one little root here and there. So stretch out those roots um, because you don't want that to be how the roots end up growing in the ground over time. Um, they'll, they'll continue to grow in a circular fashion. And then you're going to put the plant in the in the ground so that the top of the soil, the collar, uh, is at or even a little bit above the soil surface. Um, if it's a little bit above the soil surface, it'll kind of sink in over time and, and be level with the soil. And then the, the, the soil that you dug out of that hole, you're going to fill it back in. Um, I usually use my fingers and kind of shove it into the, the gap there and make sure there's no air gaps and just firmly tap it down and, and pack it in. Next slide. And with the leftover soil, you're gonna create a little berm around the plant. And this is about six inches from the stem of the plant. And what this does is this is where you're gonna water. So create a little berm. This is a great project for kids who like to play in the mud. Um, and they, they may wanna help you with that. You could even make a little heart shape or anything fun, right? Uh, and so after that, you're gonna spread the mulch that you've uh, got in with your kit and be careful not to let the mulch touch the stem of the plant. So keep it a little bit away, keep a little area around the plant uh, clear. Then you're gonna wanna water by hand. Um, and we'll talk about watering by hand in a second. Um, next slide. So watering. And so this is what the, the berm and a freshly watered uh, cactus or native plant will look like. So let's talk about hand watering. Next slide. And, and so hand watering is the best method. Um, this fosters a connection with our landscape. Uh, and really, you, you have an idea of what's going on, right? Um, versus putting on a, you know, a, a timer and just walking away. If, uh, if you have, you know, more of a connection with your plants, they're more likely to succeed. And so you're going to water each one of these little basins inside the berm twice, and then you're going to let them drain. And so what you're doing is you're mimicking um, rain, really. And, um, and then, you know, by going slow and watering them twice, you're avoiding erosion as well. So the water stays in the berm. You're filling the berm, letting it drain, filling it again, and letting it drain once a week. And there's different ways to hand water. Uh, a hose um, is, you know, the easiest. Uh, if you have a shower setting on the nozzle of your hose, even better. Um, buckets are great, especially if you want to get a little workout and, you know, take a bucket to each plant, um, get a, it's, you know, you get two things done at once. Watering cans are great, especially if you have kids around the house. Kids love watering cans. And so that's a, a fun one. And um, if you have a rain barrel, you can use your, your rain water uh, with, you know, with gravity, right? And so you could slowly let the hose seep into these basins. So various ways to hand water. Next slide. And so, you know, this is a, a picture of a plant, or sorry, of a, of a native plant landscape, um, slowly getting into transition. The plants are growing. This is after a rain. We have a nice little area where the water is gathering and seeping in. And I'm sure these roots of these plants are absorbing that water. So. With that in mind, we want to water like we are Mother Nature uh, if we don't have rain. Next slide. And so what we are, what we're trying to do is establish our plants so that we don't have to water them in a couple of years. We want them to get strong and we want them to grow long roots and tap into water down below in the soil 
that we may not even know about. And so you're watering thoroughly when you are watering and um, you're allowing the soil to become dry in between watering um, because we don't want the roots to, to rot. And so that's one reason we talk about watering once a week because by the next time, the next week that you come back, the soil should be dry and then you water it again. And what's going on is the roots are almost pulsing and growing a little more and growing a little more and kind of seeking out their own water. So you keep uh, minimizing that watering as, as uh, time goes on. And so as plants are established, you continue to increase the interval between watering. Next slide. And so an example of that is you water once a week for the first month, then every two weeks um, for the second month and on and on and on. And so, you know, this is very dependent on your soil. Um, and so go to the wa Long Beach Water Department website to look at what kind of soil you may have. Um, but this is a very general rule that, that works. And this is, you know, based on your, our average drought year. Um, as you can see, we've had variable rain in the last couple of years. So we're still technically in a drought. We still want to water our plants like we're in a drought. But let's say you have a storm come in um, in the fall and the winter, don't water your plants. That's what the plants are waiting for. And that's why we're planting in the fall so that we do take advantage of any, any rain events that will help us out and save us some water. Next slide. We get this question a lot about wilted plants and there's a lot of possible causes. Uh, some of them are um, the soil may have salt in it. We may have gotten a frost. Um, there may be root disease. Rodents could be chewing on the plants, you know, gophers, uh, maybe uh, you have girdled roots because you didn't e uh, extend the roots out of the pot. Um, you may be overwatering or underwatering. And so some quick solutions are to check the soil where the roots are. Um, if it's dry, then water. If it's moist, don't water. Maybe you're cutting, you're, you're watering too much. And so you wanna cut back those wilted parts of the plant and hope that it, it bounces back. And so that is a general rule. Um, there's a lot of ways to look into what the potential bigger problem is. And um, you know, one way is to go to the CNPS website and we'll talk about that in a second. And next slide. And so one to three years after planting, you're gonna have mature plants, you're gonna have a mature garden and it really just depends, right? On the weather and your soils and how much attention you put on your parkway. Um, this is basically what we're trying to do. And this is when our plants are established, they're about three times bigger and they need really minimal attention and very little watering. Um, and you'll really, by that time, you'll have a connection with your, with your plants that you'll know if they need water or not. Next slide. Summer watering, we, we wanna be very careful. So some plants can tolerate it, but the majority can't and they will die. So we get root rot, we get crown rot, and this is by soil borne pathogens. And so you may wanna water in the summer, but only once a month in a really deep soak and on cool days. And that's only if you really need to. And sometimes you'll even hear it on the news, like water your plants because it's been a hot one. Um, but that's one reason we start planting in the fall. So by the summer, your plant, is pretty good, pretty established, doing well, and you don't really have to water it um, uh, to keep it alive. It's just more of a deep soaking. Next slide. So a couple of tips for care to finish off our presentation. We'll talk about mulching, some pests, and some pruning. And so pests. So, you know, a lot of, next slide, and a lot of uh, healthy native plants have less pests than ornamentals. And so the issue is really figuring out what a pest is. I took a picture of this rabbit chewing on one of my um, California uh, uh, sunflowers or bush sunflower. And I realized, you know what? It, ate, it only ate one flower, ate a couple leaves, and then it moved on. I was like, that's not, that's not a big issue. And so it wasn't a pest. It was, if anything, it was doing a little pruning for me. So you want to keep that in consideration um, when thinking about pests. And so let's go to the next slide. So we talked about good pests versus bad pests, right? And so we wanna to start to learn to recognize good pests from bad pests and maintaining a healthy native garden. Um, and so if we do maintain a healthy native garden, then you will likely minimize the bad pest problem. 
um, because you, you end up having a balance of good pests and bad pests, and they may take care of each other so that you don't have to. Next slide. And so there's something called integrated pest management. And basically what it, what it means is first monitor the situation if you think you have a problem. Um, check it out, look around. And if you, if you think it is a problem, then figure out where it's coming from. Is it, are the ants going up a tree, down the tree? Are they in a plant? Where are they? What, and what is the issue? And so a little investigation will teach you a lot of what the, the issue may be. And then once you figure out what the issue is, then you want to look at the different uh, pest control methods and not just jump to, you know, your usual um, chemical or killing method. Um, there's a lot of different methods to, um, to deal with this situation. And, and then evaluate and revisit and you can change your pest control method if that first um, easier method of pest control did not work. And so if you look at pest management and, and um, you know, for your issue, you will, you'll, you'll come up with maybe a list of potential options to help you out. Next slide. And so aphids and monarchs are a perfect example. You know, monarch caterpillars eat the plant, but the plant grows back. The plant is adapted to that eating of, of you know, its foliage by a caterpillar um, from the monarch. Aphids, I see aphids on, on uh, milkweed all the time, but I don't see them doing much. And so I, I personally have not seen them as a pest. And so you want to use that kind of evaluation is like, maybe it doesn't look good, maybe I should remove them, but is it really damaging the plant or is it feeding the birds that come and eat the aphids? So you wanna take a step back when you do see potential pests and reevaluate and maybe visit the Native Plant Society forums and ask us questions if you don't know what the pest is or if you have questions about how to treat it. Next slide. Argentine ants are a big one and this is a, a bad pest causing a lot of problems. And so um, if you see a line of ants going towards a plant, um, you're gonna wanna take care of it in some way um, because on the right, you'll see a plant typically like this where you'll see green grass growing out of a dead plant. And that's because these little Argentine ants, these are the same ones you see crawling through your window, um, they're, th they cause problems. So um, same thing, you wanna look up uh, you know, Argentine ant control and maybe use an organic way to take care of them. And hopefully you don't get to this point because not everyone has Argentine ants. So lastly, we're running um, to the end of our presentation here. Um, next slide. I wanna leave you with some resources um, and, and that way you can explore a little more and learn a little more on your own time without rushing it. So. We have uh, the Native Plant Society has a blog and there's tons of helpful articles and news stories um, and people sharing different uh, information on there. So you go to the cnps.org and under news and stories, you'll see uh, a gardening section. And so you'll start to find um, all kinds of really good advice and really good gardening techniques um, and uh, you know, very interesting articles. Um, you can also search uh, for anything in particular, if it's an Argentine ant or an aphid, and the articles will pop up. Next slide. We also have the CNPS garden Q&A, and so common native plant gardening questions are answered here by native plant experts, because if you're dealing with it, you're probably not the first, and um, people have dealt with it and probably figured out the best way to go about it. So this is a really good resource as well. Next slide. I mentioned the CNPS Garden Ambassador Program. And so the, these are people just like you, neighbors, uh, people that live locally that have been planting native plants for a while. And so um, these are great uh, uh, videos and articles um, to get you inspired, um, to get design ideas, to get installation and maintenance tips and challenges and advice. And you'll probably see these people around the neighborhood or at a native plant tours or a garden because they're our friends, they're our neighbors, and they're people just like you and I um, that just enjoy beautiful native plants. And so with the 360 virtual tours, um, they're amazing. I, I really highly suggest you, you take a look at one and you'll be hooked and want to check out other people's gardens in a very virtual way. Lastly, um, 
There is a Tree of Life nursery. This is one of the biggest nurseries in California that sells native plants. And with that, they have a ton of resources because they've been around for quite a while. So if you go to their website, uh, californianativeplants.com, um, they're a great partner of ours and they provide a ton of resources, online resources that are free. Um, they also do workshops and they're just uh, really helpful in helping you and understand what your native plants are doing, what kind of pests you may have or other design ideas. And so please um, take a look at uh, that uh, resource there. And with that, um, I know we're at the time here. And so I just wanna thank you all for spending your evening with us and um, for all the questions. I don't know if we have time for questions, but uh, I am around and my email's there. You can also go to the South Coast uh, Native Plant Society website um, and uh, come to a meeting uh, digitally or physically, maybe in the future. Uh, my name is Chris Sarabia and I wanna thank Anne-Marie and Tina and Tina's contact is right here. Um, and anything else to add? Yes, so the winners of our Soil and Moisture Sensor giveaway, you were chosen at random, but congratulations to Janelle Franklin and Donald Fairley. Please expect an email contact and we'll let you know when's the best time for us to drop off your prize. And we did have a couple of good questions come in if you have some time to answer them. One of them was, um, what if you just planted um, in your parkway this spring? Should you still water once a week? And also how many minutes if you're just watering once a week? Yeah, that's a great question. And so yes, you still wanna water um, and water with that same, uh, that same formula, right? Once a week, uh, for the first month and then start cutting that back in half. And by the time we get into the warmer parts of uh, summer, um, you should be minimized on your watering regime. And, and so if you have that berm set up around your plant, that's basically how long you're watering. You're filling the berm, you're letting that drain while you go to another plant and fill that berm and just kind of, you create a, a little cycle. And by the time you come back to the first plant, it's drained and you water it again. And so you want to do that twice for each plant and just fill the berm. Gives them a chance to water deep and slow a little bit to really sink in. How about Tina, do you allow native trees in the parkways? Yes, we do allow street trees, but I believe you have to apply for a permit to plant one, and that would be found um, with our public works department. And we have a list of approved trees as well. I will drop a link in the chat to that page. And then you had, there was a question on upkeep, like pruning, thinning, et cetera, et cetera. And that is what we went over at last month's talk, and I think is available through your YouTube site. Is that correct? Tina? Yes, it's on our YouTube. Um, it's LBWD Conservation, and I also can drop the link for that in the chat again as well. There's also the Theodore Payne Foundation it is not too far away, and they have some terrific videos on how to prune, and hopefully before too long, knock on wood, some upcoming in-person classes on pruning. I think that covers most of our questions that we hadn't gotten to in the chat. So thank you both so much for speaking. Um, thank you everybody for attending. And somebody had asked about verifying their credit for attending the training. Um, I'm not sure what the credit is for, but you have contacts here for um, the South Coast chapter as well as for Long Beach. So we're glad to help you figure out how to get verification if you're looking for various kinds of credit. All right, well, thank you both very much. This will be up on Long Beach's um, water before too long. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. everyone. Have a good night. All right, have a good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Good night.